Good morning. I'm Ken Malloy. Welcome to the World Elder Abuse Awareness and Prevention Event. It's my pleasure to be here today to help bring awareness to the critical issue of elder and dependent adult abuse. This annual event is hosted by the Fresno Madera Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, which is a program with the Valley Caregiver Resource Center here in Fresno. Now, due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, this year's event is being presented in a different format than you're accustomed to. Next year, we hope to gather again in a large in-person venue. But for this year, we've assembled a great group of local professionals who deal with all types of elder abuse here in Fresno and Madera County. So let's get started. We begin with our very special guest, Fresno County District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp. Lisa Smithcamp was elected to District Attorney back in 2014, and under her leadership, she has expanded service for everything from helping our local veterans to dealing with major fraud crimes to animal cruelty to prosecuting drug dealers to locking up violent criminals. She also has a very unique perspective on protecting our senior citizens, and she was kind enough to share some of her thoughts with us today. Lisa. Hello, my name is Lisa Smithcamp, and I have the honor of being the Fresno County District Attorney. I'm here this morning to talk to you about a very difficult subject and a, a crime that is so important to our community, elder abuse. The elderly are some of the most precious people in our community, and it is so important that we do everything that we can to protect them. We have a dedicated prosecutor in the Fresno County District Attorney's Office who is strictly involved in the prosecution of elder abuse cases. It is a very important topic for all of us, but very frankly and quite honestly, it's a very frustrating topic for the district attorney's office because it is so hard for us to prosecute these crimes without proper investigation. And the, the investigation that comes from the law enforcement agencies is solely dependent on reporting. And as many of you know who are involved in this field, the reporting of elder abuse is not significant enough. It is horrible that the crime occurs, but the reporting levels versus the number of cases that happen are very low. Uh, the, there are so many issues which you're all very aware of um, with regard to relationships of the abuser to the victim uh, that are so very complicated. Uh, they get very, very difficult with family and um, paid health care providers, nursing homes, uh, family members who have ulterior motives other than just simple care and love of the victim. And in order to combat this and in order to have people uh, bring these cases to us so that the law enforcement officers can properly investigate them and then turn them over to us so that we can lawfully, ethically, uh, and morally prosecute these cases and hold people accountable relies on people. And if we don't have people common citizens, everyday people to assist us in this process, we can't do our jobs. Education and awareness are the two things that are so essential, as you all know, in this process. As we have seen with so many of the other ills of the crimes that happen to our vulnerable populations, domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, and most recently with human trafficking, we see that education and awareness is the key to putting an end or at least putting a huge stop to the, the cancer that is this abuse that goes on to our vulnerable populations. So it is so important for us to keep fighting and keep pushing, educating healthcare providers, family members, community members to, to say something when they see something because the elder people who are in our population deserve that from us. The Fresno County District Attorney's Office is dedicated to doing whatever we can with whatever resources we can muster to assist anybody in this community who is willing to step forward to help us make these people who are abusing our elderly accountable for their actions. The physical abuse, the mental abuse, and the financial abuse of elders has to stop. We have to be involved. We have to take care of each other. And in this community, the community of Fresno, is this is what makes Fresno unique and special, is that even though we are growing and our population is growing, we have such a diverse community full of ethnic backgrounds who care about family. 
And this is something that I believe we can we can capitalize on and we can use our churches, our faith based communities, our nonprofits, our law enforcement, our schools to really start to get the message out that if people see any type of suspected abuse, that it has to be addressed. The work that all of you do every day in order to combat, you know how frustrating this can be. And it is so frustrating for us in the DA's office when we know that people are being abused, but we don't have the information that we need to bring a case to court or bring somebody to trial. And it, again, is a very frustrating process. But I think that if we keep pushing this message out and we keep talking and we keep on and on and on of making people aware of how important it is to protect our elders, we will get elder abuse to the place where domestic violence was 20 years ago, where it was the hidden secret and no one talked about it. And as time has progressed and as media has progressed and social media has progressed, we have all kinds of platforms now to do for the elderly what we've done for domestic violence victims, sexual assault victims, and human trafficking victims. And the more awareness and the more education that we have, the easier it's going to be to send the message to the perpetrators that they are not going to be allowed to mistreat our elderly. So keep working, keep pushing, and thank you for all the work that you do. If there is anything that we can ever do in the DA's office to help you, your organization, your department, please reach out and let us know. Thank you so much, Lisa Smithcamp. We now hear from Detective Skip Swain with the Fresno County Sheriff's Department Elder Abuse Unit. He has a great deal of insight and experience to share with us. No doubt you'll sense his dedication and commitment. Skip? I'm Detective Skip Swain, Fresno County Sheriff's Elder Abuse Unit, and I'm here to just share a little guide to elder abuse investigation with our collaborative partners in Fresno County. What's the barriers to investigating elder abuse? Uh, I would say training or lack thereof. Most law enforcement officers and first responders receive little training in the academy and not much thereafter. It's not attractive, it's not fun, and it's not exciting. And if it's not mandated, people won't seek this out on their own a lot of the time. APS social workers receive little training on how to work within law enforcement um, or how to work with law enforcement. Oftentimes the lack of knowledge leads to a non-case or a call to detectives uh, or walking away saying it's just civil and not understanding. This is what we know or do we? CNBC reports back in 2016 that financial fraud is hammering retirees to the tune of $36 billion a year. But in 2019, there was different uh, reports out. Consumer Reports says that about 6.6 billion uh, is the take by relatives or caregivers, um, and 12.7 billion is the take by uh, criminal fraud, con artists, identity theft. National Center on Aging says this costs range from 2.9 billion to 36.5 billion. No one really knows. And why don't we know? Well, we don't know because of the reporting rate. It's alarmingly low. One in 10 Americans say that they've been abused um, over the age of 60. Have, su have suffered some sort of elder abuse. Some estimates range as high as 5 million el elders who are abused each year. And one study estimates that only one in 14 cases of abuse are reported. If you do the math, we're looking at 7% of this being reported. Uh, and there's many reasons why it's not reported. There's a lot of shame involved. There's embarrassment involved. Sometimes there's a lack of capacity and just a uh, flat out not knowing that someone is abused until maybe after death and there's a probate case that goes on and then there's a discovery that there was abuse and so it's not reported. A lot of this is uh, 
accomplished through undue influence. A lot of a lot of elder abuse is accomplished through undue influence. So where we make a victim dependent upon a perpetrator, we isolate that victim. We manipulate the victim through trust or fear, and we gain control of their assets. There's different paths to abuse, but some of the main paths that I see are power of attorney. Once you give somebody a power of attorney that you have given them complete control um, to do whatever they want, and if they're not acting in your best interest, then there is a good chance for financial exploitation or abuse. Power of attorney is just a legal expression of trust where a principal grounds an agent the ability to legally act on their behalf. The power of an agent is even greater when he or she acts for an incapacitated family member. There's no checks and balances often. Abuse of that power is not just something that the agent can be sued for, it can also be criminal. Also, a path to abuse is through a trust. Baby boomers are one of the most trusting generations. We have undue influence, and I've just gone over that. And we have the dependence on others where we don't manage our own finances as we get older. We trust other, others to do that for us. And what are we as an investigator seeing or what are we investigators seeing? We're seeing the body outliving the brain. We're seeing mental health issues by people dependent upon elders. We're seeing IHSS fraud leading to neglect because if there is a care provider who's being paid by the state and an elder or dependent needs a higher level of care and is sent to the hospital or to a skilled nursing facility or some other um, setting for care, that IHSS money is stopping. And so it's advantageous if someone is not acting in the best interest of the person they're caring for, but in fact, in their own best interest, they would keep that elder or dependent in their own care and then the condition worsens and leads to a neglect case. We also see a lack of family involvement. A lot of folks in nursing homes um, who are just forgotten about. Um, we also are seeing the decriminalization of drugs and not keeping people in custody. The true codependency oftentimes I see within elder abuse is where an elder really needs their care provider or family member to continue to have their independence. And that care provider or family member also needs the elder for their well-being. So there's a there's a certain amount of abuse or neglect that would be tolerated so that each can uh, be in the position that they that they want or need to be in. And we also see a growing population of elders. Um, some investigative tips for our collaborative partners. We check case histories. We think safety. We contact our law enforcement representative. If you need background on a residence to see what types of calls for service have been coming from that. Avoid interviewing the elder with others present. Avoid that influence and also be able to better check capacity when you talk to somebody alone, when they're not being prompted by a family member. Look at the photos involved or photos from old cases if you have them available to you. Check medical records if you have them or if you've, or if you've uh, collected them. We also wanna to talk to our neighbors. They're great sources of information. Oftentimes neighbors don't wanna get involved, but sometimes they've, they have good information that can help us in, with an investigation. We also wanna to talk to relatives. And, and find out the history of a person, especially in a self-neglect case. Let's see what type of care this person has been provided um, and who's been providing that care. And we wanna to remember to collaborate with other agencies because they're the ones that all have a piece of that puzzle and we can put it together and maybe make an impact for that elder or dependent adult. And I'll leave you that with this, I say, where there's smoke, there's fire, or it's a barbecue. And we need to look over that fence to see if it's an emergency or if it's just a barbecue. And sometimes by looking over the fence, 
We can't see that. We have to maybe open the gate and go into that backyard and really check. And these folks are dependent on us to do that. They're depending on us to do that. I am Detective Skip Swain, Fresno Sheriff's Elder Abuse Unit. If you need to report elder abuse, please contact your local law enforcement agency or Adult Protective Services hotline, which is answered 24 hours a day. It is 600-3383. Thank you so much, Detective. We've also invited representatives from both the Fresno County and Madera County Adult Protective Services. They can give us a unique insight into the types of services they offer for victims of elder abuse. We begin with Dr. Greg Sanchez with the Fresno County Department of Social Services, Adult Protection Services. My name is Dr. Greg Sanchez, Social Work Supervisor with the Fresno County Department of Social Services, Adult Protective Service Program. It's an honor to be here today at the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day event. It's an exciting time. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about our agency and investigations processes for the Adult Protective Service Program. Before I start, did you know that some of the national statistics indicate that one in 10 older Americans are victims of elder abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation? And furthermore, that research shows that elder abuse is widely underreported and that only one in every 14 cases of elder abuse is reported to authorities for investigations. Locally, in our county, our social work staff has investigated a total of 2,600 cases since July of 2019. Of those cases, 1,975 of those were elders, and about 630 were dependent adults. The most frequent types of reported abuse here in Fresno is health and safety, with almost 330 confirmed self-care, hoarding, non amputating medication, over and under related issues. The other significant reported abuse issue is financial exploitation with an, about approximately 170 confirmed cases. This is pretty significant, and our team of social workers works diligently to address these issues in our community. So welcome to the Fresno County Adult Protective Services. Adult Protective Services is here to investigate reports of abuse, assistance to elderly and dependent adults, and provide the necessary resources to address the abuse and neglect issues. Who does Adult Protective Services serve? We serve any elder, any person who is 65 years of age and or older, and dependent adults, any person between the age of 18 to 64 who has a physical or mental limitation that restricts his or her ability to carry out their normal daily living activities. So the role of our social workers is to investigate and stop the abuse or exploitation if occurring. We will work with and contact law enforcement if a crime has been committed, and we provide education and information to consumers, caregivers, family members, and support persons. We work to develop short-term and long-term goals to address risk and safety factors that put our consumers at risk. Talking about resources, we offer resources to our community agencies. We work with our local medical providers. We will work with our mental health resource programs. We work with our public guardian's office as needed. And we will work with our homeless prevention services within our community. We now also offer HomeSafe, which is additional support services to help keep our older adults in their own homes before they lose those homes to eviction, and or code enforcement. We assist our local police officers and our police department and sheriff's office and assist in providing assistance with 5150 holds. We work with our emergency medical service community members and medical providers and hospitals and nurses to provide intervention and support services to make sure that we mediate and broker services that will assist our clients 
through times of need and crisis. Some of the roles our community needs to be aware of, roles not performed by adult protective services, include adult protective services cannot remove the clients against their will. We also cannot place clients in skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes, and adult protective services cannot provide direct mental health services. Our community and our consumers need to also be aware that all adult protective services are completely voluntary. Abuse can occur by others. In some of the cases we investigate are physical abuse, neglect, psychological abuse, financial abuse, abandonment, sexual abuse, and isolation. By self, we look at issues of self-neglect, poor physical care, non-compliant with medical care, and in some situations, a malnutrition and dehydration where our older adult population cannot access appropriate food resources. So we do work with mandated reporters, and some of our mandated reporters include physicians, medical professionals, clergy members, local law enforcement agencies, all employees of healthcare facilities such as hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, adult daycare centers, and residential care facilities. But really, any person can make a referral to adult protective services, and especially those who have assumed the full or intimate responsibility for care or custody of an elder dependent adult, whether or not that person receives compensation. Financial institutions are recently added or have been added to the list of mandated reporters and continue to make reports to adult protective services to investigate financial abuse, financial exploitation, and what is most occurring is scams in our community. So mandated reporting, mandated reporting timeframes. What you need to know is that in order to make a referral test, you can contact our Adult Protective Service Care Line by phone, and we need that as immediately or as soon as possible to our agency so we can begin the investigative process. For mandated reporters, we also require a written report, which must be sent within two working days of making the telephone report to our agency. Please make sure that those reports, the written report and the phone call report, coincide or match each other so that we can have as much information for our social workers to begin the investigative process. Information needed in the report, we will need the name of the person that is abused. We also need the address of the person being abused, which also includes location because sometimes they're not at home. We need the age, the date of birth, and the specific allegations for our social workers to address when they engage our clients. So mandated reports, can be sent to adult protective services if the abuse has occurred in the private residence, the apartment, hotel, motel, or homeless center, shelter. Other jurisdictional investigation agencies include long-term care ombudsmans, California Department of Mental Health, the California Department of Social Services. The long-term care ombudsman's office investigates abuse which has occurred in nursing homes, adult residential facilities, adult daycare, residential facilities for elder abuse as well. So even if you're not sure, contact Fresno County Adult Protective Services and if needed, we will make sure that the referral gets to the appropriate jurisdiction or investigation entity. So in conclusion, elder dependent adult abuse takes many forms and can happen to anyone. We can prevent abuse by remaining involved with our elders and dependent adults by providing education and advocate advocacy, but mostly by, by being involved. Together, we can see a world without abuse. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Greg Sanchez. Next, we have Sharon Diaz with the Madera County Department of Social Services. She shows us how Madera County is working to help our senior citizens. Hello and welcome to the 2020 Elder Abuse Awareness Event. My name is Sharon Diaz. I currently serve as a Deputy Director for the County of Madera Department of Social Services. Let me give you a little background about myself. I've been employed with Madera County for 28 years and spent the majority of my career 
serving the seniors and dependent adults of our community as an adult protective services social worker. As young social workers, we often enter the field with a focus on serving children. Child abuse and neglect are heartbreaking and children are so vulnerable. They need protection. However, who talks about the elders and dependent adults who are also so very vulnerable and are often abused and neglected? Working in a smaller county can be challenging, but has offered so many opportunities to allow experiences in all programs that we serve. I'm thankful to have had an opportunity to serve children and families in child welfare services, but I am forever grateful to have been exposed to the world of adult protective services, where I found my passion in working for the seniors and dependent adults of our county. Although this program may not be prevalent in the news, it's unfortunately prevalent in our community. Madera County Adult Protective Services received over 800 reports of elder and dependent adult abuse in 2019. The number is continuously growing. The frightening part about that is that national statistics reflect that only one out of 14 victims reports. Elder abuse in the state of California includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, abandonment, abduction, isolation, and financial abuse. The isolation of seniors due to the COVID-19 pandemic has made addressing elder abuse even more challenging. Families are visiting less and seniors are more dependent on their caregivers to meet their basic needs. Nursing homes and hospitals are limiting or denying visits to reduce the spread, but that leaves our seniors and dependent adults alone and without much support. Madera County DSS has an awesome team of five APS social workers who work diligently every day to advocate for and protect this population. Madera County APS works in collaboration with Madera County Behavioral Health, the Community Action Partnership Agency, Madera Community Hospital, Madera County Sheriff's Department, Madera and Chachilla City Police Departments, and the Madera County District Attorney's Office to serve the needs of those that have been victims of abuse. Madera APS also works on outreach to provide education in hopes that we can utilize prevention efforts to reduce the occurrence of abuse. We continue to encourage people to make a report when they observe, suspect, or are told about abuse, but we also encourage family and friends to remain involved with their seniors and dependent adults. Those connections are proven to reduce abuse and enhance well-being. We want our parents and grandparents to have a sense of safety and security. I know that is what I hope for as I grow closer to that stage in life. Elder abuse is not a pretty subject, but it is an important one. All people deserve to age with a sense of security, dignity, and respect. As we bring issues of elder abuse into the spotlight each June, let's remember to keep the light burning throughout the year and continue to seek new avenues to support our seniors and prevent future abuse. Many thanks to Greg and Sharon for all that you and your staff do to help our vulnerable seniors here in Fresno and Madera counties. Now, we just heard from local officials who are working to protect our seniors in private homes and residences. But there is a special type of help for seniors who live in a licensed long-term care facility. Our next presenter is Susan Bouchon. She's the program manager for the Fresno Madera Long-Term Ombudsman Program. She shows us how the program is working to protect a specific sector of seniors. I'd like to tell you about our Ombudsman Program. The primary purpose and our mission statement is to advocate for the dignity, the quality of life, and the quality of care for all residents in long-term care facilities. Ombudsman pro programs are mandated to exist by federal law, and they are in every state. And in California, we have 35 ombudsman programs that serve the whole state border to border. We're Fresno Madera Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, and we cover the counties of Fresno and Madera counties. We have uh, 250 facilities total and about 10,000 residents that we advocate for in these facilities. Uh, in, we have 36 skilled nursing facilities and 220 assisted living or residential care facilities for the elderly. We work for the residents, we don't work for the facilities. Our services are free and confidential. And we are resident centered, which means we take our marching orders from our residents and we can only go as far as they would like us to. There may be an occasion where we wish we could go a little bit further and see something to a completion, but if it's not what the resident wants, we have to stop at that point. We make monthly unannounced visits to all of our facilities. That's a lot of visits. And while we're there, we can assist people with uh, things like investigating complaints that they have made or someone has made on their behalf, a violation of their rights, 
a lot of people don't even know what their rights are. And residents have rights in skilled nursing and in assisted living settings. They have rights given to them by federal and state law. And so we're there to help them learn what they are and understand when they're violated. Uh, they're trained though, our ombudsmen are trained, I forgot to say this, that they, when they go into a facility, some of them look like a hospital setting, but it's actually the resident's home. The resident lives there. And so I always train our ombudsmen that picture going into a home with a picket fence and a, and a wreath on the door because it's the same thing. Residents live there. That's their address from now on. And so we want to be very respectful of that while we're there. And we knock on the door and ask permission to come in before we will go into a room. So we actually respect them in a way uh, because we're their advocate. We want them to know we're there for them and that they can trust us. And, and again, some of the things that we can help them with, uh, we have to be invited to residential care meetings, family council meetings. We can't just go. We uh, also can attend their care plan meetings if they would like to have an ombudsman present, but it's at the resident's request. We investigate a lot of resident to resident altercations, which is actually a form of elder abuse. And we, we do those a lot in memory care units. And then we do a lot of help with people and family members when they want to find a new place to live, a new facility. There's ways that you can make a smart choice and look at citations and visits and different problems that may have happened at a facility so that you can choose one that doesn't have those type of issues. So we do a lot with that. We also do a lot of referrals to outside agencies, community resources that are available for people. And in the skilled nursing setting, we as ombudsmen are the entity that witnesses the signing of advanced healthcare directives. Uh, that's not an unusual thing. It's not in every state, but it is in the state of California. So in all of our 35 skilled nursing facilities, we do go in there and cover uh, the witnessing of those, that document. So as Ken mentioned earlier, ombudsmen are responsible for investigating all claims of elder abuse and allegations that occur in a long-term care setting. In fact, California is one of only five states that has this responsibility given to the local ombudsman program. So there's many kinds of elder abuse, uh, abandonment, abduction, deprivation, financial abuse, exploitation, isolation, mental suffering, neglect, physical abuse, serious bodily injury, sexual abuse. Those are all forms of elder abuse and they occur all the time. They're not reported all the time and that's hard for us to take, but we do our best. And in fact, we do trainings. I go in and do uh, mandated reporter trainings at all of our facilities if they'll let us and help them understand what the timeline is for reporting abuse. Mandated reporter status is given to anybody who works at a facility. No matter what they do there at the facility, they're mandated reporters, and they need to know what the law says about it. And so the easiest thing to uh, help people understand is, as a mandated reporter, if you see something yourself, or you hear about something from another person, or you have a reasonable suspicion that something has happened to a resident, by law, you have to report it. And there are different timelines based on the different type of abuse. So if it's not very serious, they have 48 hours to, uh, to report many of the types of abuse. But if there's serious bodily injury, they have two hours to do a, a line of reporting that's required to four different, four different steps. Uh, 24 hours if it's a not serious bodily injury. That's not a whole lot of time. It's not like, oh, it happens Friday, I'll take care of it Monday. No, you have to take care of it Friday. And so we do a lot of training in our facilities to make sure that they are informed about what they're supposed to do if they see something, hear something, or suspect something. So our uh, program is uh, blessed to have 45 volunteers. This program is designed United for, for the whole United States, rather, to have the programs be staffed by volunteers, workforce. And we have 45 amazing volunteers. What we try to do to, uh, to make life a little easier for them is that our staff handles the majority of the uh, elder abuse claims that do come into the office. 
and that frees them to make their monthly unannounced visits and go and meet the residents and tell them what we can do for them. Uh, when they come across something though that might be abuse, they sure make sure it gets taken care of in their facilities. Right now, we're unable to enter our facilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we plan to be fully prepared for the day that we can get back in. And we're hoping that that might be, maybe in October is what I've heard as a rumor. And I wanna go in with a larger force of volunteers that are trained and ready to help and assist and advocate for our residents because we're fearful that the ground that we have gained, we might have lost a lot because everybody's uh, resident rights are violated because people are having to stay in their room. They don't understand that. They don't understand why they can't go to the dining room and meet with their friends. Uh, there's a lot of things that have had to be a violation. We want to make sure that when it's okay, that those things don't happen any longer. We want to make sure that things pick up. And we, we hopefully will pick up where we left off with the improvements that have been made. But we do want a larger workforce to help do that. So we will, we will be offering uh, ombudsman training classes. They're called certified ombudsman training classes because the state of California certifies you as an ombudsman after you've received the proper training. So if it's something you think might be interesting to you, please call the number on the bottom of the screen if you'd like more information. I'd like to meet with you, talk to you, find out what your comfort zone is, what motivates you to do the work and uh, go from there. So uh, I could go on and on because I'm extremely passionate about the great work that we do as ombudsmen. So please call me if you need ombudsman assistance, if you're a, in a facility and you'd like us to help you when we can come back in, or maybe we can help you over the phone, call the number on the bottom of the screen. If you're a loved one of someone who's in licensed long-term care and you need our assistance, please call. Or if you'd like to be an ombudsman, please call because we really do need you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. We've talked about how and where to report elder abuse and some of the many resources that are available locally. But what if you are a victim of elder abuse? All 58 counties here in California have a Crime Victim Assistance Center, commonly called Victim Services. They strive to reduce the trauma of the crime. And it all starts with just a phone call. Joining us today is Deborah Gorman. She is the victim advocate for the Fresno County Probation Department. She shows us the resources that are available for victims of crime. Hi, my name is Deborah Gorm. I am a victim advocate with Fresno County Probation Department, James Rowland Crime Victim Assistance Center. I am assigned to the Elder and Dependent Disabled Adult Unit. In 1973, the Fresno County Probation Department conducted a research project which focused on victim advocacy. The results were that the crime victims did not receive any assistance from the public or private social work or criminal justice agencies to ease their readjustment to society or to meet their necessities arising from the victimization. They could not obtain critical information regarding court processes or referral services, nor did they receive attention and guidance in coping with the stress created by the criminal victimization experience. Recognizing these problems, the Fresno County Probation Department established a victim advocacy program in 1975. The project was the first program in California to provide services to crime victims through a probation department. Some of the crime types are elder and dependent disabled adult abuse, child molest, child abuse, domestic violence, rape, assault, carjacking, robbery, homicide, drunk driving, hit and run, vehicular manslaughter, and property. I was asked to provide information on the services we provide to elder victims. It is unfortunate that there is so much elder abuse that includes emotional, physical, and financial. Penal Code Section 13835.4 and 13835.5 lists the primary and optional services provided to the victims of crime. Some of the services are crisis interventions, which deals with contact with the victim and or their immediate family, where initial stress and trauma of crime victimization is handled. Since trauma manifests itself in many different forms, advocates are trained to look for those symptoms which could be indicative of great stress. A needs assessment is done to determine if in fact, emergency needs are present, such as food, clothing, shelter, 
medical care, and information. Referrals to the appropriate agencies and providers are made available to the victims. Criminal justice system involves the orientation into the criminal justice system. Preparing a victim witness to testify, case status disposition, court support, and the victim impact statement. The advocates also assist the victims and witnesses with law enforcement agencies, district attorney's office, MDICs, and other needed agencies. The advocates assist the victims from the arraignment through the parole hearings. Information, court support, referrals for legal assistance, and filing for a restraining order are also provided. California Victim Compensation Program assists the victims in receiving financial assistance with out-of-pocket losses that resulted from the crime. Some of the losses include medical expenses, mental health expenses, funeral and burial expenses, wage and support loss. The advocates can also assist the victims in filling out the claims. Presentations regarding crime victim assistance services, identity theft, scams like grandparent, romance, lottery, and home repairs, and other topics are provided. The more information made available to the community regarding crime and services available to assist the victims, hopefully will, crime will decrease. Please contact Fresno County Probation Department, James Rowland Crime Victim Assistance Center at 559-600-2822 for assistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Now, some of our partners were not able to participate in this year's event, but they sent along some very helpful information. We have listed several resources for you. The first slide contains information on how to send a case to the Bureau of Medicare Fraud and Elder Abuse. You can call their office or visit their website. You can also email them to open up a case. The second slide contains great information on how to report problems related to COVID-19 fraud. It's the National Center for Disaster Fraud Hotline. You can also visit their website. The last slide is the National Elder Fraud Hotline. It's open every day, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The hotline is staffed by professionals who know how to support victims of fraud. English, Spanish, and other languages are available. Remember, reporting provides valuable information to law enforcement officials so they can help protect others from becoming victims as well. Well, we've managed to pack a lot of information into this 60 minutes, haven't we? If you'd still like more information, please contact the Fresno Badera Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program at the number that's displayed at the bottom of the screen. We also want to thank our partners because it takes a team to make all of this happen. Today's webinar was brought to you by the County of Fresno Department of Social Services Adult Services Program, the Fresno Madera Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, a program of Valley Caregiver Resources Center, and the Fresno Madera Agency on Aging, and lastly and not least, CBS 47's Eyewitness News. And by the way, planning for next year's event is already underway, and we hope that you will join us on Friday, June the 25th, 2021. So thanks again for joining us. I'm Ken Malloy. Let's get out there and protect our senior citizens.